And I shoot my shot, it's the whole wild way it's going in. Cross niggas like Bubba Chuck, I never gave a fuck. Hook shot a hole like Kareem, but I never lead a fuck. I hit that Janobi with my left hand all like, woo! Bitch, you want when we shooting in the gym? Wrong nights, I perform like Mike. Anyone, Tyson, Jordan, Jackson, action. James Harden with the range on me, nigga, way back. Michael Jordan, 1985, bitch, I travel with a cocaine circus. And you can live through anything if magic made it. Let me tell you something. New York is back. I'm out here, the fucking place is packed. Gorgeous. The food is terrific. It's the only fucking place to be. Where the fuck? Can it be in fucking Palm Beach with the brunch of Wall Street assholes? We want to be here with the real people, man. Workers, hard people. The greatest, the greatest town that ever was, man. Fuck everybody else. It's New York only. What up, my fellow Knicks fans? This is your guy, Marcellus Ease. And don't panic quite yet. Now, first, I want to say congratulations to Coach Tibbs. Well deserved. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He squeezed every bit of juice out of this roster that he could this whole season. And it's no coincidence we see him do it with Derrick Rose, Taj Gibson, and even Julius Randle. And clearly, there was no more juice left once we got into the first round matchup with the Atlanta Hawks. And there's no shame in that. This roster was very limited. We've seen Capella kill us down low. And we couldn't sort of draw a matchup in which we could have another stretch big man on the floor alongside Julius Randle to pull Capella away from that paint. And this is pretty much where next season, us having a full season, including Summer League, could benefit us. Because in that series, had Obi Toppin been a bit more well-polished, Tibbs could have went small and played Randle alongside Toppin to pull Capella out of the paint. But the NBA next season does plan on doing a Summer League. It's already set, booked, and dated. The MGM Grand is already reporting. It's going to be from August 8th to the 17th which is about a little bit over a week. So that's great news to hear. Guys like Quickly, Toppin could definitely benefit. But man, having a summer league next year is definitely going to be very beneficial because Obi Toppin, particularly in the series against the Hawks, even though he had limited minutes, he showed us that he could stretch the floor with his three-point shooting. He also, in key spots in the Hawks series, played good defense. And most importantly, he showed us that in transition offense, he could help us by finishing at the hoop. Because all season long, whether it was a fast break, three on two or one on two, we struggled at finishing at the hoop. We've seen a lot of clunkiness happen, guys not finishing at the rim. And, you know, with his high flying skills, this definitely can help us score a lot of those transition points. So Summer League has its role. I know sometimes that shit is boring as hell. But at the end of the day, whatever the young guys were working on during the offseason, whether it's their dribbling moves or certain jump shots, they can at least put it in play in a live game during the summer league. It allows them to practice these things. And last season, we've seen guys literally come fresh off the draft into like one or two preseason games and then tossed on into a really condensed season. But overall, we've seen a lot of flashes from Quickly and Obi Toppin, which is great to see. But now, whatever they work on this offseason, at least they get a practice run to see how it works within game speed. Now this offseason, we're going to pay attention to the roster construction a bit more closely because it's going to be very interesting to see if the Knicks continue these one in one year deals with all these players, having them come in and off the team every year, changing up the roster, because now we're pretty much beginning to be in the stages of helping our young guys develop and we're going to need more polished players and we're going to also need to provide those players with a bit more commitment on our end on being part of the team for the future. When you look at guys like Nerlens Noel, that's on a one year, Alec Burks, Reggie Bullock, Derrick Rose, of course, with the performance they had this season, they're probably gonna be looking for a pay bump. But overall, because the Knicks had them last year, it's not gonna hit our cap crazy. But at the same time, we also have to look down the road. Are we trying to make a splash this off season with a possible trade? Because there's barely any good free agents or are we trying to at least show some sort of commitment to certain guys to build around our key guys like RJ and Randall 
to be at least a consistent team going on for the next four to five years. Now, I know this is something a lot of Knicks fans don't want to hear because we're used to the old way of just making a big splash during free agency or a trade, and then we tend to try to figure out the rest later. But once again, because of this year's free agency list is so bleak, there's no major splashes, we're probably going to have to take the slow and steady pace and try to work with what we got or try to find key role players here and there to fit into the team and try to at least try to commit to them somewhat long term so we could develop some chemistry because having that chemistry is very important that's something as Knicks fans sometimes we tend to overlook because the past few seasons we've seen guys come in and out like a revolving door off the team on the team and we've even seen players make remarks for example guys sometimes would normally say you know i'm only here for one year i'm just trying to play into my next contract or there's no real chemistry because everyone's kind of in it for themselves and no one knows where the organization is heading so historically especially in the last 10 years we've seen that having all these guys bounce in and out the lineups it doesn't work and we can go far back as to the carmelo anthony days where in his nick tenure he played with over 70 different guys and as we've seen, that doesn't really work out, having guys in and out the lineups like that. But there will be opportunity this offseason for us to start to deviate away from all these one-in-one -one contracts, especially starting at point guard. Just looking at some of these free agents, you got guys like Kyle Lowry. We can give him possibly a two-year deal or three-year deal. Mike Connolly, Drogic is available. Lonzo Ball, Dennis Schroeder, Spencer Dinwiddie. I mean, I'm not exactly in love with a lot of those names, but at the end of the day, some of those guys are a bit more polished than what we had this past season, and they could alleviate a lot of the issues that we had, particularly in that series against the Hawks, in which we don't have to play Derrick Rose, especially at his physical condition because of all his injuries. We don't have to play him 38 minutes plus a game. You can get someone like Kyle Lowry, who's more polished, who can get other guys going. We don't have to rely on Randall to be that playmaker. See, at the end of the day, the Knicks right now, they're beginning to get to a sweet spot in which guys like RJ and Randall, they don't need younger guys to come onto this roster and be part of this team. It's to sort of have to go through a learning curve. They need more polished guys. And we've seen that just going through that old traditional route of just keep drafting and hoping it doesn't really work. You can look at the Minnesota Timberwolves, for example. How many first overall picks are going to keep surrounding around Carl Anthony Towns? The results are still the same. They're at the bottom of the division every single year. So now the fact that we're coming off a winning season, we've shown as a franchise that we're headed towards the right direction. Other free agents are looking at this. They're like, okay, they got some momentum. There's a possible shift here and there's a lot of money to be made because it's the New York City market. And with that overachieving season that we had, Next season, there's going to be major expectations, especially from the fan base, of what this team can do. And we're going to see how these players perform under that pressure. See, it's one thing to perform when no one expects anything of you. But now that the fans expect a certain level of winning, a certain level of performance, a lot of these guys are now going to be put under that test. And it's a great place for Leon Rose to begin to make that shift and start committing to some of these free agents and really start building some of this chemistry up for the long term and don't be surprised if some of these draft picks that we have for this upcoming draft if leon rose somehow packages some of those picks to get more polished guys because the nba right now is the ever revolving door we've seen certain teams get eliminated from the playoffs like the portland trailblazers and there's going to be other teams and some of them going to have to come to the grips of reality of what is the future of their teams and have their teams already peaked so certain guys are going to begin to be entering the, the trade market so if we look at what we have right now in those two first round picks which is our own first round pick we have the dallas mavericks first round pick it's possible that some of these things could get packaged to get more polished guys around this team because once again there is going to be an expectation level among the fan base i'm pretty sure among the ownership on how the knicks will be performing next season they're already talking about even raising the ticket prices. So the expectations will be there. Now we talked about some of the external forces the Knicks will be facing this offseason, like trades and free agency. But let's talk about some of the internal issues that the Knicks are going to have to come to grips with. And we'll see which direction they take. One is Julius Randle's contract, upcoming extension for this season. And also Mitchell Robinson's extension situation. How the Knicks are going to play that out. First, I want to start off with Mitchell Robinson. 
Of course, the Knicks have him on a great deal. It's only $1.8 million for a year. They can either let him hit restricted free agency this offseason, in which they'll be able to match. Now, this could work out well if the Knicks are able to pull off a trade and perhaps get a max deal guy like Damian Lillard. This is just an example. Or they go after another big name player that's going to take a lot of cap. Then even though that superstar play takes up a lot of cap space and won't matter because the Knicks are allowed this offseason to go over the cap and re-sign Mitchell Robinson. So this scenario would only apply to this offseason because Mitchell Robinson is a restricted free agent. It wouldn't apply next year because he would be an unrestricted free agent. So we would not be allowed to go over the cap next year. So keep that in mind. The only thing with Mitchell Robinson is very difficult to evaluate how valuable is he? Because this season he was injured in and out the roster and his replacement that we got on a one year deal was able to almost duplicate the production that he will provide. So I'm wondering how much money he will be asking for. And in today's NBA, it's not that hard to find a center that can at least give you decent minutes to protect the rim for about 25 minutes a game plus. It's not that difficult and it doesn't cost as much money. So that's one thing that Knicks fans should be looking at and it might be a cause for concern. And I'll also say this about Mitchell Robinson. He shoots about 56% from the free throw line. And I know he's stated a few times that he wants to shoot three pointers, that he wants the Knicks to let him play his game. But it's hard for them to run plays to let him shoot three pointers when he's shooting that type of percentage just from free throws. And also, how much is a center worth where his game mostly relies on alley hoops and just a point guard setting him up in his position? It's not like Mitchell Robinson has a mean front facing game where he could post you up and he could take a hook shot or he has a mean off the glass turnaround jumper. His front facing game isn't that good. So what is his real value in the marketplace? That's something that a lot of Knicks fans have to really think about. And I'm wondering how Leon Rose will approach this especially due to the fact that he was able to successfully replace Mitchell Robinson's production this year in a one-year signing with Nerlens Noel. Now, looking at Julius Randle's contract, he is eligible for a four-year extension this offseason where it can range anywhere from $106 million to $116 with bonuses. Or if Randle wants, and most likely if he believes in himself, he will, he will decline that extension and be eligible for a whopping $204 million deal over five years. Now, the reason why Julius Randle isn't eligible for the 204 this season, even though he's a seven year player, is because he opted out of the Lakers. Once again, you guys could check out, I'll leave a link in the description below of that video that I made about Randle's dysfunction with the Lakers and it, it kind of left them in a sticky situation as far as his contract this season. But going back to the current issue at hand, pretty much Randall has to bet on himself for another year. Could be risking injury, or he could be risking another floppy season, potentially, which would decrease his value in the marketplace. But overall, last season, Randall shot about 41% from three and 81% from the free throw line. So Randall is going to have to bet on himself once again if he wants to re-up for that 204. Now the Knicks to give Randall at least some sort of guarantees in case he does get injured, they could give him a one and one this off season. They could sign him on a one year deal and give him the option of reading up next year. More than likely, if everything works out well, Randall will be able to opt out next season and then re up with the Knicks again for the 204 over five years. That's if everything works out, he would have to have another good season just like this year and he would have to be injury free to prove his worth. So that's pretty much the conundrum that Randall is facing. It's very unfortunate because under normal circumstance, he would have qualified for the 204 over five years right now in a peak season that he just had. So once again, it'll be very interesting to see how this gets approached, how Leon Rose kind of finesses this situation or how Randall even handles this situation. Because once again, if he opts out, he's gonna take full risk and he's gonna take the belief in himself that he could continue to provide value in the marketplace. So by the time next season hits, he can re-up for the five years for 204 million. Last but not least, I wanna talk about, it's sometimes the moves that you don't make, you end up winning it. 
Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up, because definitely us as Knicks fans, we had a vested interest in the Dallas Mavericks series versus the Clippers, in which Dallas was eliminated in the first round, thus giving us the 19th overall pick. And just looking at Kristaps Porzingis and his performance, the fact that in game five, he couldn't even get a point. The fact that he was a defensive liability and he struggles at finishing at the rim as a big man. It's very telling. And once again, this is why I brought up the fact that sometimes you end up winning based off of the moves you don't make. And the move that we never made with Kristaps Porzingis is signing him for that extension that he got. He is way underperformed for his contract. And the fact that the injury that he had is over three years ago, and they're still talking about him not being healthy, it says a lot. And this is something that we greatly escaped. And at the end of the day, us not signing him to an extension or just being in that position to offer him that gave us an even better chance because now we have Julius Randle and we have more cap flexibility. And in the Mavericks case, they have a lot of cap room tied up with KP in which defensively, he can't even get a defensive stance down low to at least move side to side fast enough. And offensively, he settles for a lot of threes. Now, Luka's already frustrated with KP. A lot of their beef is starting to spill over, especially after that loss with the Clippers. Now, remind you, KP's defense was so bad that Dallas had to play zone defense with Bourbon. And everyone knows Bourbon is just a big-ass center who just moves slow. But at least he protects the rim. That's something that KP wasn't even doing. So it is what it is. The reason why I bring this up, I know a lot of Mavs fans are going to be hating on me. But at the end of the day, the media, they stay going over, oh, how could the Knicks have done this? They gave off Porzingis for no reason. And this is the follow-up to it. And sometimes it's the moves that you don't make that you end up winning in. And we still have two first-round picks of the Mavericks, being the 2021 first-round pick of the Mavs and the 2023 first-round pick of the Mavs. So it is what it is. Dennis Smith Jr. was a wash. The other players are pretty much wash. Tim Hardaway Jr. looked like he worked out better for the Mavs than the KP part of the trade. Once again, it is what it is. Like KP said when he got traded from the Knicks, the truth shall come out. And the truth definitely has come out. After that injury, your stamina is still questionable. You still can't post up smaller guards than you. You suck at protecting the rim. And potentially, the surgery that you had, they might have botched it. Because the fact that you can't get down low in your defensive stance is really questionable. And the fact that when Mark Cuban had traded for Porzingis, he even stated that Porzingis was very behind schedule on his recovery time. And that was almost a year after the injury. Once again, it took the bubble to happen for KP to play an NBA game in the month of April. And that's him being a four-year NBA player. And he still got injured for the Clippers Maverick series that happened in the bubble. It is what it is. The valuation of this trade at the end of the day is that the Knicks had won this trade due to the fact that they were never in a position to offer an injury-prone player an extension. <sighs> KP, man, you asked for this trade, and now you're upset because you used to be known as a unicorn in New York City, but now you're just an afterthought in Dallas behind Luka, a.k.a. the Matador. Man, don't think we don't notice. We see Dirk Nowitzki coming down from the Raptors showing Luka mad love, but I don't know about you. Don't know about you. I think you and your brother overestimated yourselves in this situation. So it is what it is. You guys got pretty much lost in the sauce. Miss in the sauce. Can't trust the stamina of a seven footer that gets his clothes ripped by a five foot guy in his own country. You look like you want some mama cooking. Until next time, you guys stay safe. Peace.